Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Clay Gordon. This is The Chocolate Life Live. I'm the host today. I'm also the creator and the moderator of thechocolatelife.com. And today I am really, really excited to be able to have with me in the studio live Terry Collingsworth. Um, Terry is the Director of International Rights Advocates. Uh, many of you will know him. He's been a guest here on the Chocolate Life Live uh, uh, twice in the past. And we've been discussing the legal cases which International Rights Advocates has been uh, pursuing in U.S. courts. Now, unfortunately, Mickey Mistrati, who is the director of The Chocolate War, had a scheduled conflict um, flying from London back to Copenhagen, can't make it today live, but I did have the opportunity to have him uh, to record an interview with him a couple of nights ago. And so we're going to get that into the middle of things, as always, right? Um, if you're watching, wherever you're watching, whether it's on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Facebook, please go into the comments. Let us know where you are connecting from. So where in the world? Not necessarily from YouTube or LinkedIn. That, that, I'm, that I'm curious about, but it's not what I want to know. But if you're watching from the United States or you're watching from Europe or you're watching from somewhere in Latin America, please let us know where you are uh, connecting from. And I'm going to be getting to those shout outs and to any questions you might have in the third segment today. So we're going to spend the first 20 minutes with Terry talking about the current state of affairs with the legislation or not the legislation, but the legal fights that are going on. Then we're going to join, the, we're going to take a break in the middle of it and watch my discussion with Mickey and then come back after that discussion and find out about what's next for what's going on. And with all that long introduction out of the way, Terry, please welcome, welcome to the Chocolate Life Live. Oh, thank you so much, Clay. It's good to touch base again. And I hope that uh, we can uh, bring some news to this just intractable problem and give some hope to the people who want to see child slavery end in the cocoa sector. I, and I am totally with you. And it's nice to see you again. The last time we saw each other was the first time we met face to face. You were here in New York City uh, for a, a partial screening as well as a tasting hosted with the Museum of Food and Drink here in New York, here in New York. And that was a lot of fun. But yeah. first things first, I mean, people will know the last time we were on, we were talking about the Supreme Court case, right? And I believe it is the Supreme Court case, which is the one that is covered in the Chocolate War. Correct. Right? So what's up with the Supreme Court case? Where do things stand right now? Well, unfortunately, so the Supreme Court uh, found that we did not satisfy this unbelievably complex invention of theirs uh, for an extraterritorial test for jurisdiction. What that means is that the cocoa companies, Nestle and Cargill that we had sued said, you can't sue us here in the United States because the events occurred in Cote d'Ivoire. And the Supreme Court, uh, very pro-corporate as always, uh, created a standard that was essentially you have to show, quote, the claims touch and concern the United States, close quote. So we argued that, well, Cargill and Nestle, their officers are here. They made the decisions here. The money's here. They made their contracts here with the cocoa companies. All of this and creating their supply chain intentionally that relies upon child slaves uh, that all occurred in the United States. The Supreme Court, again, favoring corporate America, disagreed and said that we hadn't sufficiently shown this, although they gave us the chance to go back to the lower court, which basically said, no, the Supreme Court didn't leave you any air here. Now, it's important for a couple of reasons quickly that uh, we sense what the Supreme Court did do with the law. I believe after reading the decision that the only way you could use what had been a terrific human rights tool, the alien tort statute, the only way we could use it now is to show that Cargill and Nestle kidnapped kids in the United States and then took them to Cote d'Ivoire and made them work. That, that's just a ridiculous interpretation of a statute that goes back to 1789. So that case is done. Uh, but thankfully, we so learned. If I, so if I can, just very quickly. So cool. the Supreme Court said, you know, here's where it's been. It's been gone through the appeals process, gone up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, you know what? You, we're going to send you back to California, which is where the suit was originally filed. And then we're going we're going to give you the right to amend your complaint. Right? Well, they didn't actually say that. And in typical okay. Supreme Court fashion, they left it rather uh, vague as to why they were sending it back. 
So we argued that, of course, we get to amend. But the uh, the, the the appeals court that had given us a tremendous victory, I, I think that they probably felt they had been smacked on the wrist hard enough that they basically said, we don't see any room here for you to amend, given the Supreme Court's test as applied. So so that that was it. The one good thing that came of the case, though, is that Nestle and Cargill had their lawyer, Neil Kochel, who tries to fashion himself as a progressive. Uh, he was formerly uh, Obama's uh, solicitor general. He stood up in court and said, you can't sue a corporation for slavery because only individual humans can be sued under international law. Uh, five of the justices, including Alito, very conservative, mm -hmm. absolutely rejected that silly argument. Mm -hmm. and, so did, 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 that, did that rejection of the argument end up in the final decision? Only by counting the votes because there were okay. concurrences. So we know we have five votes who explicitly yeah. said no, that's not the law. Okay. And three, the other three didn't mention it at all. So we might very well have them. So that is good to know going forward that there is no safe harbor for corporate criminals under international law. So even though what happened as a result of this decision is they took away this tool, the alien tort statute, which, as you say, goes back to the late 1700s. This is no longer an effective tool in the United States to be able to pursue these misdeeds. Right. Should you have to go back to the Supreme Court, there does appear to be, as you say, no safe harbor for these companies to say, well, companies can't enslave people. That's correct. Okay. I will note that uh, a group of lawyers uh, that we regularly work with on human rights issues, we quickly drafted an amendment to the alien tort statute that simply said, and it applies extraterritorially, yeah. to get rid of this Supreme Court invented test. Mm -hmm. uh, it got nowhere in the in the last Congress because we were like number 382 on the list of things everyone was trying to rush through while we had democratic control. Right. And now we don't. So uh, yeah. we have that bill ready to go. And it's hard to imagine why someone would be against it other than protecting yeah. corporate America. But given the way we've seen some of the votes go in this new Congress, right, there are people who will vote no just for the, the, to the point of voting no. So yes. it, 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 but you're right. I mean, is such legislation, given the makeup of the current um, House of Representatives, is not likely to go anywhere. So let's let's move it. Just just one quick comment. Of course. Though. So I, I just want people to understand that the alien tort statute on a good day when if you if we had a good judge, it extends to slavery slash forced labor, torture, genocide, extrajudicial killing mm -hmm. and uh, war crimes. So. These corporations fought tooth and nail to kill this thing that only required them not to murder people and enslave them. And if you look at their codes of conduct, they're promising like bathroom breaks and great wages and all this stuff that they've said they're going to do. And yet the truth is they don't want any regulation and they want the freedom to enslave. All right. So. With that behind us, and it is behind us for the next several years yes. at least, right? Um, let's go to what's going on in the D.C. District Court. Now, this is a case which is filed under an entirely different legal premise. It's not the Alien Tort Statute. It's something called the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act. And my understanding is that all you need to do, well, maybe all you need to do is simplistically putting it, is to be able to show that these companies profited from this behavior now do they i mean i'm on the do they have to have knowingly profited from it or just profited from it yeah the standard is they have to know or should have known that their business associate that they are in a partnership with or a venture with uh was was using forced child labor and that the companies benefited from it, which they automatically do due to the cheap uh, labor involved. So that is the standard. So we filed a brand new case uh, under the TVPRA in a federal court in the District of Columbia. We unfortunately drew a brand new Trump judge who, once again, as they always do, created a new test and said that the, the plaintiffs here, well, let me stop there. We have eight former child slaves who were trafficked from Mali and taken to Cote d'Ivoire and forced to work. We have sued Barry Calibut, Mars, Hershey, Nestle, 
Cargill, Olam, and Mondelez. And we allege that through the World Cocoa Foundation, that they are all cooperating together to preserve this system that they've created that is dependent on child slavery. So aiding and abetting this whole enterprise gets every single one of them liable for any incident of child labor, forced child labor at any of their places, any of their plantations. That's our legal theory. The Trump judge uh, said, no, you have to show that each kid could trace their harm to a particular company and dismiss the case. Now, that is absolutely not the law. That is the standing doctrine. Who can you sue? Who do you have the right to sue? So we're on appeal on the standing doctrine only. And the argument has been set in the Court of Appeals for April 12th, just a few weeks away. And we are confident that we will prevail on that fundamental constitutional doctrine. And I, I also want to add that pretty much every case we've had involving these serious human rights violations, the district court throws it out, including the original Nestle and Cargill case. We prevailed on appeal until twice until the Supreme Court then intervened. And that's the pattern I expect to see here, that we will win on appeal, we'll go back to the trial court, and then hopefully we'll reach the merits. But the legal theory is very solid, and this statute is pretty safe from tampering because Republicans voted for it because it also outlaws sex trafficking and the religious right really was enthusiastic about that. So I think we have a good statute, a good theory, and we will ultimately prevail. So just a quick question for, for people outside the United States who may not be familiar with the way this works and are sort of confused because we've been focusing on like Georgia grand juries and how they're different from New York grand juries. But um, the the appeal from the district court is going to be what to a three judge panel and it's going to come back down. And then I suppose the, the defendants will have the right for an on bank appeal to the entire. Judge. Yes. Okay. Well, yes, it's a three judge panel. We have a good panel. We, we have the names now. And if we prevail, uh, the defendants don't have a right to an on bank or the entire court uh, review they have the, the right to ask for it, but it's rarely granted except in extraordinary cases. And the standing doctrine at issue in this case is so first year law. It's so simple and fundamental. I don't see that as an issue that the whole court's going to need to weigh in on. Right. But of course, I mean, it's a good thing. I mean, we understand now just how important um, the choice of judges are in any particular case. I mean, you know, it, we could have, for example, if the the judge that you were in front of for the the original um, hearing of the complaint was in fact either an Obama era judge or a Clinton era judge, you might not be in this appeal process right now. Absolutely. Okay. And for those folks in the U.S. who who don't vote, that's why it matters who is president. You put those federal judges on for life. Yeah. And uh, Trump put on more judges in four years than any president in history because him and McConnell formed a, a sort of a dirty alliance where that was the only thing they agreed right. to do together. Right. Right. Yeah, I don't want to get too deep in yeah, the Amer yeah. American politics. But <laughs> I mean, it, but it does talk about how fragile, I mean, the thin line upon which certain certain rights, certain privileges that we take for granted, how thin that line exists. Many things exist just in terms of convention, this is the way we've always done them. And what happens is somebody comes along and says, no, right? And you go, ah, you know, things that we thought were enshrined in law turned out to be very, very differently, That's uh, very differently um, codified or codified, not at all. But let's go from there, right? So you've got an appeal on the 12th of April um, about standing. So you want to know that, in fact, you as the plaintiffs have standing to bring this case. So that's an important thing. But there is one more case where I think people, I mean, it's been out there for a long time and it's around the Customs and Border Patrol. Now, my understanding is that there is existing legislation that gives Customs and Border Patrol the ability to reject shipments to foreign countries when the contents of those shipments can be traced to some sort of illegal activity. Is, is that my understanding well, on the safe ground there? It's close. Um, okay. 
it's a customs and border protection and they're they're right. they're, they're claiming to be doing more of that lately but the the statute it goes back to 1930 it's the tariff act of 1930 and it only allows them to block shipments coming to the u.s that are produced or harvested in whole or in parts that's a quote in whole or in part by forced labor and uh until 2016, it had this giant loophole that there had to be sufficient domestic production of this product to allow them to block the import coming from outside. So we've, we brought a petition against the cocoa industry in 2005, and it was dismissed because of this consumptive demand uh, language where there's not enough cocoa grown in the U.S. to satisfy consumptive demand. So our, my former board member and now very famous politician, Bernie Sanders, got rid of that language in 2016. So now there is no longer this consumptive demand exception. So we filed a new petition and we filed it on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2020. And Customs and Border Protection is just sitting on it. Uh, it's languishing there. And we understand through folks that are unhappy with that, that they're sort of afraid of the, the giant cocoa industry lobby and the implications of cutting off these shipments from, from Cote d'Ivoire. But that's not in the law. There's no exception of they're big, bad companies and we're afraid of them and it'll be politically dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's not in the law. So we're about to file a complaint under the Administrative Procedure Act where a federal court has the power to order the agency to act. They don't have the power to say how they should decide, but they have the power to say, look, you've been sitting on this for three years, make a decision, that's your duty. So we're, we're about to do that. I've given up uh, on the uh, CBP proceeding in good faith. So what I wanna do is I know that in past, I believe Terry, you had um, a link somewhere on the International Rights Advocates website where people could send um, an email to uh, one of their legislators. Now, is that something that people can do to tell them about this customs and border protection? Um, no, we, we, don't, we don't have that on our website, but that's a good idea, Clay. I think we, we'll, we can put that on pretty easily. What we do have is a link where you can communicate directly to the cocoa companies that we have sued. So there's a, there's a, a, a link on there where you could directly just click on it and you could write to Nestle and say, we're not going to buy your lousy chocolate until you stop enslaving children. And same with all the other companies. Right. But, but I think that, you know, you know, some sort of mechanism and let me show myself. So I'm just not this disembodied voice <laughs> coming from somewhere. Um, but I think there's some sort of mechanism that would enable you to communicate directly with people who have an influence on whether it's a decision to get made or not should be something. And of course, <clears throat> you have a friend here in the chocolate life. And um, if you do enable that sort of mechanism, it is in fact something that I would promote widely to the network and suggest that everybody who is interested in this share with all of their friends. Great. Thank you. We'll do that. I know that others have something like that. I don't think it would be a big technological leap to borrow mm -hmm. that and put it on our website. Thank you. Great. So um, you know, for people who are watching this now, um, Terry and I spent a few minutes before this, um, before the start, and we decided we're going to divide the hour into three parts. So we're going to do this introduction part, which was about um, legal um, challenges which had been brought in the past. Um, now we're going to go to this roughly 20 minute interview that I did with Mickey about the chocolate war. And when we're done, we're going to come back and we're going to look at like what's going on in the future. So what are the new legal actions? And at that point, what we're going to do is we're also going to take questions. But before that, what I want to do is I want to give a quick shout out to the Mark and Yuri who are connecting from Kittredge, Colorado at Blue Spruce, Blue Spruce Chocolate. Thanks for having you here today. Uh, Michaela Schupp, who's connecting from Hanover, Germany. So Michaela, I mean, I'm, you know, you and I haven't seen each other in person for many years, but I'm glad you're able to join us today. Um, we have um, Abisayas Barita Ramirez. I don't know where you're connecting from, but thank you very much for joining us today. And then Mike at Encore Coffee in Kansas City, Missouri, um, is here today. And Mike is one of the stops I'm making in the Cross Country Craft Chocolate Odyssey. I'm going to be there um, on well, around Easter weekend. 
um, going to make a stop and visit there. So I'm really, really excited about that. So Terry, while I'm playing this interview with Mickey, what I am going to be doing is I'm going to be closing your microphone and closing my microphone. So don't worry about, um, don't worry about any of that. And with that, everyone, um, let's go Welcome, with everyone to this special pre-recorded interview segment with Mickey Mistrati, who is the filmmaker from the chocolate war. Unfortunately, because of a, a last minute scheduling conflict, he's not going to be able to join us live, but fortunately we found time in his schedule. Uh, Mickey's in London at the moment. I'm here in New York. Um, so that what we can do is we can hear from him about what it is that's going on, what is happening with the chocolate war since the last time we checked in. And Mickey, you said one of the things about the chocolate war is that there's an awareness that people have. And you were talking about an experience you had with some people in Ghana. So that's where I'd like to begin this this evening. Yeah, no, it's, it's really um, good to know that the film is also having a, um, a life in, in Africa, because I think it's really important that, that um, the local communities also get this information, especially um, in the um, cocoa producing uh, countries, Ghana and Ivory Coast. And I, um, I, I got some very interesting um, uh, messages from people in both countries, but lately, uh, from um, from uh, Ghana, and um, I think I can't say too much because it's secret information. But I think I am looking into a really important news story, um, but I can't reveal um, anything about it now. But if just half of it, what I heard, um, is correct then more shocking news will be out there. Not tomorrow, not next week, but mm -hmm. eventually it will be out. Well, I do want to say that, you know, however this story breaks, you have a friend here in The Chocolate Life, and we want to help um, get the message out about the work that you're doing. So what I want to do is, again, talk a little bit about The Chocolate War, because I understand that it has been um, receiving actually quite, notable widespread acceptance um, at film festivals around the world. Um, but there, but, you know, let's go back to the beginning. So the first film that we know about was um, the dark side of chocolate that was done in 2010, 2011, 2012, sometime Eight. around the, 2008 is when the filming was done. Yes. Okay. Cause I think, cause I see the publication it date. Out, it was out in world premiere was 2009. Okay. So um, I mean, you might want to go look at your IMDb page because I think that they've got the wrong information on the IMDb page. Yeah, um, but <clears throat> how would you characterize? Um, so you know, if we look at, for example, what it is that Terry is doing. So Terry Collingsworth and International Rights Advocates, what they're doing is they are using legal means, the legal system to try to hold big chocolate accountable for what's going on. But there's this separate need, and it, I think it's the need that you and your films are taking, which is just general consumer education and awareness. So how would you characterize, number one, the reception of the film, you know, Chocolate War versus The Dark Side of Chocolate, and how you think that consumer or the general sentiment, like within the chocolate industry and among the general public, has changed over the course of the last now 50, almost 15 years? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I I did an interview with a um, eighth grade um, school um, children the other day, and they actually asked me the same question. Um, and it is an interesting question because when I look back, I think the biggest um, change is when I did the first film years ago. Um, the chocolate industry um, were just saying that they didn't know about the problem and they were shocked about it and they want to fix uh, this problem. Now, um, today, if you go to the websites of any chocolate makers or producers, you will find glossy um, websites, um, Instagram profiles where they're really fleshing out um, how much they care about this problem. But the fact is, mm -hmm. it's still a problem. 
it's 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 not fixed it's not even close to be fixed it's even worse than it was so in terms of changes i would say the only thing is now um people are more aware of it and the general public are more aware of it but it's not like done a lot unfortunately i, I would love to say that oh yeah i was part of uh, this and i was you know i didn't fix it 100% but we fix it more or less i think i cause a lot of problems for the companies and that makes me happy um at least because i think more and more, more i push more and more that people like carry push for it i think they will eventually <sighs> sort of give up because they need to fix it anyway because we won't disappear mm -hmm. and the problem won't disappear without um uh, the money and the will from from the chocolate industry and i think that one of the things we're seeing is that unless there is um very very focused consumer sentiment that says hey you know you mondelez you mars you nestle you calabout you whoever you know you need to change and if you don't change then we're going to register our displeasure at the supermarket checkout i mean so i mean this is why i see working in parallel is such an interesting component of it yes we can hold the companies legally accountable but it you know what that remedy looks like you know what it, the companies will have to do to solve the problem you know it, this is us law and we're talking about foreign countries and it's it's a challenge um but with the consumer sentiment that we're talking about is there is a chance to register dis register displeasure in a way that you know shareholders and investors will listen to which is declining sales right which is i think really important um but um, I want to I want to step back a little bit, if I can, and just talk a little bit about sort of the differences between the dark side of chocolate and the Chocolate Wars films. So, you know, I, as you may know, I went to art school. I studied photography. There was a film department. You may know some filmmakers who came out of Rhode Island School of Design. Um, but one of the things that strikes me about the dark side of chocolate is that there is no one central person who is the core of the story. Whereas in The Chocolate War, you've made it very, very much centered on Terry, right? And the work that he's doing. Terry is a character and the work that he's doing. So I'm, I have to assume, right, that was a very deliberate choice. But yeah. what was the choice made? And how did it change the way you shot the film? Because, you know, it's a very, yeah. very different story. Yeah, it's, it's, it's completely different, uh, the two films. The first one, The Dark Side of Chocolate, is it's a proper investigation, a journalistic-based investigation, um, where I am the reporter who investigate uh, more classic, um, where I use classic journalistic tools um, to reveal the problem. Um, and 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 revealing in that in in that sense was um, visual proof of uh, child uh, illegal child labor and also how trafficking of children is is um, actually um, an ongoing problem. So that was that was a proper journalistic investigation. Uh, the Chocolate War is more a documentary film. Um, still an investigation, but the investigation is um, from Terry's point of view. And I made that decision because, you know, first of all, because I thought he was an amazing character. Um, and the work, you know, I didn't know in the beginning when I met him is seven years ago, um, but what he has been doing on this um, field um, is amazing. I think mm -hmm. I can't, I think we should be thanking him a lot for the work mm -hmm. he does because he's been doing this for like decades now. Mm -hmm. um, he's the reason together with his team, of course, um, and people around him and supporters, he is the reason why we have 
um, all these cases, the court cases, which I think is really important because this keep um, um, the light on the problem. Um, it's not going to disappear. And and for some reason, you know what, today I still think he reminds me of myself in a way. Um, so he says, is it a film about me? I don't know. Uh, but I just see myself in his work and his way of acting. Um, he's just a... He's a um, a um, legal person. I am a journalistic person. So that's the only difference. But we do investigate both of us. Mm -hmm. So so it's it's a it's a completely different way. But um, I did the the chocolate war comparing to the dark side of chocolate. But mm -hmm. but yeah, and I think the. Um, the, the experience you get by watching The Chocolate War is more uh, like a fiction film um, than my first one, which was more like a strict journalistic report. Mm -hmm. uh, just, uh, yeah, expose what is part of the industry, where we are experiencing the problems through Terry and what he sees and what is important for him for his legal battle against the biggest food companies um, in the world. And, and Cargill is one of the biggest food companies in the world. Let, let me see if I, if I can. You know, so, so has the reception on the documentary film festival circuit surprised you in any respect? I mean, it, 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 is it beyond what you had hoped for? And I think what is the most surprising reaction to the film that you've had coming out of that group of watchers of the film? Um, no, I think I, I think I expected that there were, were interest. There was interest for this film from festivals. Um, but in, in the festival world, it is sometimes a bit tricky because timing is everything. And right now, um, there is a lot of focus on uh, the Russian war against uh, Ukraine. So most of the attention goes in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, and I respect that fully because it's really important. Um, two years ago, it was or three years ago, it was Syria. Um, mm -hmm. When I started my film seven years ago, in my mindset, it was the right timing. But things are changing through time because mm -hmm. new crisis comes up, and 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 it, it's difficult. It's a difficult field, right. but there's been a huge interest for it. But I was expecting that um, anyway. Um, and 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 when I look back, still. Um, I've been thinking so much about if the outcome uh, of the film was the completely different of what it is. Now, I do not want to to tell um, the end of the film, but it could have been the opposite. Mm -hmm. Would that have changed anything? I don't know, but I'm a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. I am not mm -hmm. trying to 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 change the reality. So I just follow the, the track of, of Terry. I just want to let you know, there's not too much of a spoiler alert going on here because Terry will be talking about the case <laughs> that was covered um, in the movie. Uh, yeah. But what I want to do is I want to say, so the film was released, what, over six months ago now, is that correct? Uh, well, a, it's a year ago. It's been a year already? Yeah, and then the release in the US ah, okay. was a few weeks ago. Right. So I want to talk, I want to talk about that. So um, there's been a lot of interest from people here on the chocolate life and people in the communities that we're connected to who said, where can I go see the film? Where can I go see the film? And it was the release, I believe it's on Amazon, um, not yes. just in the U S but also in the UK. Yes. Um, and then on Apple TV. Um, and so I'm can you, can you tell us about the journey to get yeah. from just sort of this limited release distribution that we're doing market by market into yeah. you know these these powerhouse global streaming platforms yes it's um, again um the film was uh, funded by um uh, 
uh, European uh, broadcasters. So, so it had to to be released in the European countries first. Um, the, the thing is, Europe is one market. US is a different market. And, and, and they are like almost same size in a way. So, um, so you, the whole US is the same as the size of, of Europe. Um, so, you know, I would have preferred that it was out earlier in the US mm -hmm. because of Terry and the case was in the US. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this Jupiter's doesn't want to, um, um, to do it like I wanted and, and they pay the money for it. So I just had to, you know, go with the flow. But <laughs> on the other hand, this kind of film, which is really important and sometimes difficult to cope with as a filmmaker is it has a long tail. It's not just release date. And in the old day, you know, in the old days, you had a release date and everybody was like, oh, focusing on it. Today, it's different. You know, it's new to someone who watched it today, even though it was released a year ago. And, and this is also good for the course against um, uh, child labor in, in the chocolate industry, that it's not just a short window. It's long tail and it will continue. So, so in a way, now it's just starting growing in the US and the story will not, not disappear like in the old days where it was on the front page on, on a uh, old um, newspaper or a report in a news uh, program. And then, you know, if you were lucky two days later, everything disappeared. Right. Lucky if you were were the the, the villain in it. Yeah. Well, we're still talking. We're still talking about the dark side of chocolate, um, and um, yeah, I, I'm sure you know that there is at least one copy of it which has been uploaded to YouTube. Oh um, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. So I, 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 but, but, I, you, I, but you, but you talked about the long tail. You talked about the long tail, and you, one of the things that I will share uh, that will be shared today as we present this interview. Um, um, in the live stream with Terry live is that there are going to be links to the dark side of chocolate and there are going to be links to other resources and that, and the reason why I'm doing that is so that it, number one, it helps keep it fresh for those people who may have, may have heard about it, but aren't aware of how to find it. Right. And there are also links on, um, it mentions very, very specifically that you can, if you're an Amazon prime member or you are an Apple TV uh, plus member, um, you, it's available to watch right now. So after you get done with the live stream, don't don't leave the live stream to start watching, but after the live stream, it's available to watch right now. And I understand it's also available on Vimeo and one other platform. So if somebody wants to actually purchase a copy um, for themselves, yeah. rent a copy, it's available. Um, yes. And it, has that was that part of the distribution plan all along? I mean, as an Amazon Prime member, I suppose I could download but I, I don't know it's it's very complicated sometimes yeah but then the, the, the most important is it's available um, mm -hmm. for the US um, viewers and yeah English speaking um, mm -hmm. people around uh, uh, the world Australia and the UK New Zealand Canada um, which is really important well speaking of which is has there been uh, an effort to find the funding to um, dub it. I, I don't want to dub it. I sub subtitles in Spanish. Oh, because has, uh, because I've had, I've actually had requests from Chocolate Life members. Like, will it be available yeah. in Spanish? I um I I don't I I think it might uh, be. I have a an American um, co-producer and a distributor, uh, Rocco Film in LA, and they are taking care of all that. And I'm pretty sure that. Um, they're looking at the Spanish speaking um, uh, Latin America. Um, yeah. But I, yeah, I need to find out. But you're right. The, the, the funny thing is, um, sometimes you, you get like, um, you, f you tend to forget that the world is not only Europe and the US. Asia is a huge yes. market yes. for chocolate. Yes. I was just invited 
to um, to the Emirates by uh, the Emir of one of the Emirates mm -hmm. a few weeks ago because the film had um, a premiere in the Middle East in all the Arabic speaking countries on Al Jazeera. And I was invited to meet the the Emir, and and you know, I didn't I didn't know that they were like up for um, supporting um, um, the fight against child labor in the chocolate industry, but apparently they are, which was really like um, extremely. Um, uh, it was a big surprise to me, mm -hmm. and and but they are. And they're supporting it. And even the foundation of the Emirate were asking if they could do anything to help us out uh, with education papers and everything, um, which is really um, good. And then you have Latin America, which is a giant market, mm -hmm. also on chocolate. Um, and I don't know if they are aware that the chocolate industry in, in Africa is uh, full of child labor because it's not as far as i know it's mm -hmm. not an issue in the cocoa industry in latin america on the other side mm -hmm. because i did an expose on coffee mm -hmm. um, and and the so-called fair trade coffee in guatemala was full it was nespresso and starbucks coffee mm -hmm. was full of child labor, illegal child labor. And they were like six, seven years old, never go to school with the same. Yeah, it's it's very, very complicated. I, I, I know that there are very large segments of the cocoa sector in countries that I have visited in Latin America who are proud of the fact that there is, quote unquote, no illegal child labor in cocoa in their parts of the world. Um, I, but I don't know how deep it gets down to the farm level. I know that among professionals and people who are involved in trading, um, that there is this observation. And as a matter of fact, within, I think, the craft chocolate world, there's a sense of, well, let's just avoid West Africa and let's go to Latin America because we can avoid the issues entirely. But like almost everything in chocolate, the answers are not quite that simple, and not quite that cut and dried. Um, so, Mickey, I want to I want to recognize the fact that it's getting late where you are in London. Um, it's um, almost 730. So it's almost 1130 where you are. You say you have lots of work left to do before you can um, call it a night. Um, I want to say thank you very much for you know arranging your schedule to be able to get here this evening because we had originally planned for this to be live on Friday. But stuff happens. And uh, I just want to say you know, a thank you very, very much for being here for for openness and sharing. Um, I certainly do appreciate it. I know that the people who are going to be watching this really do appreciate it. All right. And that was uh, my interview with Mickey Mistrati um, earlier this week. And we're back, Terry. But before we continue the next part of this, what I want to do is I want to acknowledge, number one is that I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing this properly, but Luigi Suguitan or Suguitan um, had the honor of being at the Middle Eastern premiere in February that Mickey was talking about. So she was there. And so we have somebody who's connecting from Dubai. I think that's really, really wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, there is an anonymous LinkedIn user who's connecting from Cameroon. So shout out to Cameroon. Um, Josh Mohagen, um, who he and his wife, Kristen, run um, Terroir Chocolate in Minnesota. So good. To, I have, you know, I've he came and visited a class that I gave in Las Vegas in 2000, I want to say 18 or so. And so I'm happy to see, you know, just see the name yeah. again, Josh, looking uh, happy to see you. Please say hello to Kristen. Um, we have Gustavo Marin, I'm guessing, um, from Ecuador. Um, so thank you for joining Gustavo and Paul Newman, not the Paul Newman. That would be a little challenge. But Paul is connecting today from Bellingham, Washington. And uh, we got a couple more, believe it or not. Um, we've got a final one from Heather Terry, who says this needs to get into the consumer narrative. And Terry, that's exactly why we are doing this. I'm also recording each one of the parts of this separately. So there's going to be a video of me, a video of Terry, and a video of the presentation. And I will be editing parts of this. So they'll be 
be able to be posted independently. There are some very, very strong things, Terry, that you mentioned. I also want to point out that, you know, Heather is a longtime friend. I've known her since about 2008. Um, she and a friend co-founded a company called Nibmore. And recently she's associated with a company called Good Sam Foods. Um, I was in Colombia last July um, on a trip um, looking at some of their coffee sourcing and uh, cocoa sourcing operations down there uh, in and helping tell the story um, of, the, of what they're doing. So I just wanted, just wanted to give a, a real shout out to Heather for all of her support. And then one more, um, Ana Hinojosa is connecting today from Texas. So happy to um, have you all here today. Um, so Terry, last 15 minutes or so, can you catch us up on two bits of new legislation or new efforts that are going on. The first thing I want to do is I want to talk about this. So this is, whoops, you know what? I need to go and do this. All right. So this is, for me, this is interesting. This is a Mondelez shareholder resolution. It will be brought up at the next annual meeting, I'm guessing. But, um, you know, there is, I reported a couple of, I want to say a couple of months ago about Mondelez making some um, moves suggesting that it was going to push, you know, its commitment under the World Cocoa Foundation to 2025 out to 2030 at least. And so can you walk us through the shareholder resolution? Now, I just want to let everybody know that this is on the Chocolate Life right now. If you go to this post on the Chocolate Life, there is a, a link or will be within an hour of um, the end of this um, to this Mondelez shareholder proposition. So you can go read it yourself. But Terry, one of the things you told me, you know, let's, hey, um, you was that um, international rights advocates had a hand in drafting this resolution. So please, you know, tell us more about what's going on here and what the potential impact of this particular bit of share, activist shareholder um, petition could mean. Well, first of all, thank you, Clay. Uh, I want everyone to know that I pretty much make clear to people who are interested in working on stopping child slavery in the cocoa sector, that if there's something that I can do to help their project uh, by as a lawyer or just as a person with a lot of knowledge, that I'll jump in and help. So I, I was I, I participated in reviewing other uh, uh, shareholder resolutions, most recently Hershey. Uh, but this one is um, against Mondelez is is really the start, I think, of a big wave of these. There's a there's a wonderful person whose name is Dr. Lewis Marmon. He is a pediatric heart surgeon at Children's Hospital. And he at some point said, look, I'm saving children's lives, but I can be also helping to stop child slavery. Uh, and he formed a group called Advance ESG, and they have a website, advanceesg.org. And he's really going to make a push to, to um, uh, try to force shareholders to take some responsibility for known child slavery in the supply chains of the companies they've invested in. So this is the first one that they've done. And I, I, did, I, I reviewed it and I thought it was terrific. But I, I, th I think it's worth flagging that you're going to see a lot more of this, that th this goes in waves, as you know. Sometimes uh, there, there was a big phase of uh, shareholder resolutions about 20 years ago, and then there are, there are groups that just do that. Um, a lot of the company investors could care less, but I think that child slavery is just so visible and so, so critical that the hope is that we will be able to bring uh, the issues uh, to the attention of the shareholders, they're going to say, I don't want to make money on child slavery. So, so, this right, so right now, you know that there's one from Mondelez. You also said there's one from Hershey. Do you know of other companies for which there are, in fact, shareholder petitions which have been presented or others that are, I, I'm guessing that if they're in the works, you can't talk about them? Well, these are the two that I, I actually know about, but I do know that the people that are behind these generally are, are getting enthusiastic about doing more. So I expect you will see more. I'm not aware that any more are pending. But generally, they're, they're trying to be conservative. They're not saying much more than, the, as a company, we need to look at this with an independent eye 
and take responsibility. And that's an excellent step one for shareholders to agree to. And uh, we're hoping that uh, that becomes uh, across the board a trend. So I'm, I'm looking at this. I was looking at it away because I'm looking at the text from it. And by the way, you, you, know, you can go to the chocolatelife.com. You can go to the post for this live stream. You will find a link to the text of this. Um, again, if not immediately, I may not have pressed the update button but it will be there shortly. Um, it says that shareholders request that within one year, so that means within, this was filed in December of 2022, the board of directors adopt targets and publicly report quantitative metrics. So um, KPIs, KP, key performance indicators, appropriate to assessing whether Mondelez is on course to eradicate child labor in all forms from the company's cocoa supply chains by 2025, that date is important because that's part of the World Cocoa Foundation's quote unquote commitments under Hark and Engel. Um, 2025 is the next date. Um, and in the board and management's discretion, such metrics may include current estimates of the total number of children in supply chain on a regional basis, working in hazardous jobs, working during school hours and employed after school hours. So I think that, you know, in addition to, um, you know, a specific request, you know, are you on track to meet your requirements, which I think is key, all right? It also says, you know, you go in and you provide us with some very, very specific numbers. And you know, the only thing I would say is you, you make sure that these numbers are, you know, updated on a regular basis so we can see your progress. But I think that that's a really, really huge request, yes. right, in terms of, you know, it, because it says, you know, you need to do this, right? And are you going to rely on figures from third-party organizations that you have no control over, right? Right. You know. So I, I, I don't know if you read it the same way. No, you're absolutely right. And the company will certainly argue that uh, that's a financial burden to the to the company, et cetera. But uh, to again, let's take Mondelez as the great example because this is pending for them. Um, the company's claim to have this information. They claim to have teams on the ground that are working to solve the problem. And so if they can't give you that basic information upon request as a shareholder, then that means they're, they're lying or they're hiding. And neither of those are acceptable in, in, a, in a situation like this. I think everyone needs to understand, though, that this 2025 deadline, it began in 2001 when these companies signed the Harkin Angle Protocol. And they promised to end their reliance on child labor by 2005. They've given themselves now four extensions of time, unilateral. They didn't check with anybody. They just said, oops, we didn't make it this time. Now we'll do it again. And the 2025 deadline that was uh, uh, identified by the World Cocoa Foundation is not even to end child labor. It is to reduce it by 70 percent. So. The, even even these guys are admitting they're not going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. They are at best going to reduce it by 70 percent. And if you think about it, that is just evil genius. They're giving themselves permission to continue to do this mm -hmm. until someday they whenever they think they can get around to it, they're going to stop it. Right. Somewhere over some rainbow somewhere. We will meet the Emerald City. Uh, and well, you know, there's probably illegal labor associated with um, the wizard, the land of Oz, but not going to go there. Um, but, but that's why I think it's important for our, you know, everyone has yeah. their own job. I heard what Mickey just said. Yeah. Um, my job and my colleagues is to try to force them to stop because clearly on a voluntary protocol that they shanghaied from a real law. Uh, the companies are in charge of their own deadline, in charge of their own systems. Yeah. They're not going to stop unless a court or uh, Customs and Border Protection, someone says, that's enough. That's enough. Right. You're going to have to stop. Right. Not in this Congress, but some future Congress says, OK, you yes. know, this protocol, you know, like, eh, you know, we're going to put the brakes on it. Um, sounds like another call to Bernie um, yeah. <laughs> or something like that. Um, before we jump into the last question I want to add, I want to get to today, which is you mentioned that there's another suit going on in California. What I want to do is I want to recognize, again, um, there's an unidentified LinkedIn user from Cameroon who says thanks. Um, and he also says, or he or she, excuse me, says it's good to be watching this in real time. Working in the cocoa sector in Cameroon, we as a group, 
work with cooperatives, showing them better agricultural practices to re to increase yield on existing farms and diversify production. You know, absolutely. I think that one of the most heinous aspects of NGO and other work in producing countries is this notion is that we as people in consuming countries get to help determine what a living income is. And I mean, this is just, you know, another, another dart, right. Or uh, some, or some sort of projectile um, into the heart of these people by saying, you know, we're in a position to determine, you know, what reasonable means in terms of what your expectations for living standards are. Right. And that's just a form of economic imperialism. I believe everybody who's involved in living income reference is all about, um, well, is not all about, is wittingly and or unwittingly, because I believe that there are a lot of people who believe that what they're doing is in fact good and will do good. But I, but I personally believe it's just another form of economic imperialism. For me, as some white guy in his 60s living in New York to tell some farmer on a farm in Cote d'Ivoire what they should expect in terms of a living wage. I mean, we can't even here in the United States determine what a living wage is. And, you know, with all of the stuff that's been going on in the last couple of months about illegal child labor in factories here in the United States, you know, who are we to, who are we to talk to anybody about anything when it comes to illegal labor? But I want to end up on a different note. Terry, you say there is a new lawsuit. Did you file it? Um, it's in California. And tell us about what the theory of the case is and what the potential implications might be should you be allowed to actually go to discovery on this one, which is what the chocolate industry is desperate to avoid. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I filed the case along with Paul Hoffman, who was my partner throughout the uh, the original Supreme Court Nestle case litigation, and his partner, Helen Zeldis, who's a specialist in consumer fraud law. And, and we filed a case called Walker versus Nestle in the uh, southern, the central district of California in Los Angeles. And the, the courts there responded to Nestle's motion to dismiss. Nestle, of course, filed the motion saying they don't have a case, just throw the thing out. And uh, the judge said, no, they have plausibly alleged that consumers are being misled by Nestle's labeling schemes, including fair trade uh, and Rainforest Alliance. And also they're leading you to believe that their chocolate is child labor free. So the court said we could go forward. Now we are battling over Helen Zeldis is doing the direct litigation. She is a consumer expert at Paul Hoffman's firm. Uh, but Nestle is resisting discovery and is attempting in any way possible to delay this, which is why the original Supreme Court case took uh, 17 years. Uh, but we're pretty confident this will move along. And, and this, too, like I said about the uh, shareholder resolutions, if we can make this a, a standard practice as well. I think it'll be wonderful to get rulings from courts that the companies are lying, misrepresenting when they claim they are child labor free or even are working to be child labor free by a certain date. And these cases are unique in that the damages aren't much. So we're not going to attract the shark lawyers uh, to get rich on these cases. This is really for nonprofits and, and activists to pursue. But what you'll get at the end of the day is an order saying they lied. And that's very valuable to in, enhancing uh, the, the public's awareness, but also destroying the credibility of these schemes that the companies continue to pro pro uh, procreate. <laughs> I can't hear you. And these rulings can be used um, introduced as evidence, perhaps in other court cases. Absolutely. Right. A factual yeah. finding that's adverse to Nestle it, it could, could be used in other cases. I want to quickly mention, Clay, I'll just quickly mention that one other thing on the horizon is that, as you may know, France in particular, but France, Germany, and the Netherlands have pretty good due diligence laws now that require disclosures of supply chains 
mm -hmm. uh, violations of the standards set by the due diligence law, including labor standards and, and deforestation standards. So I'm working with a really good team of French lawyers, uh, and we're, uh, we're definitely, I would say, in May going to file a case against a major supermarket chain in France and alleging that their uh, disclosures of their supply chains the, of the products they sell does not even mention child slavery or, gotcha. uh, or or deforestation. So that will require the supermarkets to disclose and that'll require Ooh. them to then put pressure on the, the cocoa right. companies themselves. I can't buy your chocolate unless you fix this because right. I have to disclose that I know as a supermarket that you still have enslaved children in your supply chain. It's, right. it's part of me, part of me wants to ask, part of me wants to ask is this big, um, retail chain in France. Does the name begin with the letter C? But you can't tell. You probably can't <laughs> tell me. Um, so you know we're at we're at the end of the hour. We're just a few minutes over. What I want to do, Terry, is um, number one is um, there are as a comment and there are two quick questions. I'm here. I don't know what your time is, but let's do this. Number one, I'm, I'm fine. Thank okay, you. Okay, as the person from Cameroon says, is on the back of their previous comment, this, which means is increase yield on existing farms and diversifying production. So this increases income and hence the ability to hire eligible, by which I'm going to assume they mean legal workers. And so absolutely, I mean, one of the ways, one of the benefits of increasing income at the farm level, right, is that by making the farmers more profitable, they can turn away from um, illegal labor and towards legal labor. So I think that's a really, really important, um, so really important observation to make. And thank you much for thank you very much for updating what's going on. Um, you know, irrespective of what I think of living, you know, reference uh, living income reference. But Ryan, um, who's connecting from um, LinkedIn, um, asks two questions. The first part of the question is how are shareholder resolutions dealt with by the corporations themselves? And number two, how much impact action comes out of it, I'm assuming these corporate resolutions in your experience? Great questions, Ryan. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Well, what happens at the board meeting is the board of directors of the company, Mondelez in this case, they will make a recommendation to the shareholders. And almost always they recommend against any uh, activist shareholder resolutions. And then almost always uh, the, the major institutional shareholders will follow the lead of the board of directors. So it's very rare that one of these passes, to be honest. But what it does do, and it's worth the trouble, it's not that difficult to file one, uh, is that chipping it away, each, each meeting, sometimes people have done four, five, six in a row, uh, you're educating the, the shareholders and you're also really taking away from them the right to say, sort of say, well, I didn't know. I'm, we're making the shareholders feel responsible one by one by one. And I think that's that's definitely worth doing. Um, I am aware of shareholder resolutions passing, um, but usually they are much less demanding, like, again, commissioning a, an independent study, something like that. Uh, but I think the Mondelez resolution might have legs given the the, just the wild promises that Mondelez has made about their new Cocoa Life program that you, you, you really need a pretty good reason to say, but don't don't look into this. We're just trust us. We're going yeah, yeah, right. to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what I want to do is, I, Terry, I want to say thank you. But before people leave, right, um, one of the things that um, Heather mentioned earlier, this needs to get out into the consumer narrative. If you're watching this live, or you're watching this um, in the future. Number one, on YouTube, make sure that you go and do a thumbs up on the video, like the video, thumbs up. Um, what you can also do is you can subscribe to the Chocolate Wire channel on YouTube, right? And what you can do is then share the video with all of your friends on YouTube. That's one of the things that you can do specifically on the, the Chocolate Wire on YouTube. If you're on LinkedIn, share this into your network. Right, that would be a great way to do it. Again, do a like, um, and and that will raise awareness for this entire um, this entire um, this entire enterprise, um, for want of a better term. What I also want to do is um, go back to sharing 
the screen here, let's get Heather's comment off here, is that this is the post on the Chocolate Life Live about this live stream right now. Um, so um, I've got somebody at the front door who's waiting for my time. So, all right, I, I caught his attention. Um, so what I want to do is, so this is the post on the Chocolate Life right now. Um, what you, you, you will find is that you have a link to the website for the Chocolate War. You have um, a link to International Rights Advocates. You do have a link to watch The Dark Side of Chocolate on YouTube. There's another video called Shady Chocolate also on YouTube. So again, like and share these videos. That would be a great thing to get more people aware of them. Um, a link to the Slave Free Chocolate website. I'm surprised or I'm, I, 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 I had hoped that Anne would be able to join us today. Um, I had produced something called The Wicked List some time ago, and there's a link to it here. Um, there's also links to the Harkin Engel Protocol, um, the International Cocoa Initiative, and to the World Cocoa Foundation on the website. All those resources are there today. And um, just to, uh, to close things out, Ryan says, thanks, fellas, for the response. So absolutely. So Terry, with that, again, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for the time you presented. And I'm looking forward to catching up in a couple of months. And with that, everyone, oop, one more, Fouad Mohammed. Abu Bakr is connecting. So yay, um, thanks to all that. I want to remind everybody that if you're working with chocolate and you're not having fun, even though we may be involved in very serious discussions, if you're working with chocolate and you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Ciao, everyone.